So uh, more to come. I Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, come on up. <laughs> We met in um, Curacao, right? Yeah, that's true. Ayana is a marine biologist originally, but I, I was fascinated there. Uh, my students at Pace University at the time, we were making a film about coral reef conservation. Mm -hmm. And um, we learned, largely through you, that the reef's future is very much tied to what we do on the land adjacent to the reef. And you've been working really hard with community building as it relates to environmental progress. So tell them about collective. Uh, Ocean Collective, your, ah, your yes. new uh, enterprise. You go center stage there, yeah. and then we'll have a discussion over here. Hello. So I've spent much of the past decade working with Caribbean fishing communities. And the most important thing that I've learned is that ocean conservation is not about fish. Uh, ocean conservation and conservation in general is about people. It's about human behavior. It's about shifting public opinion, corporate practices, and political will towards sustainability. A healthy ocean is critical to food security, economies, and cultures. And right now, overfishing, pollution, coastal development, and climate change are jeopardizing all of that. In addressing these threats to ocean conservation, to ocean health, we have to ask hard questions about who benefits from ocean exploitation and conservation and who gets screwed. Let's start by considering overfishing. Who suffers because of it? Almost half the world's population relies on seafood for its primary source of protein. New England and Newfoundland were devastated by the collapse of the cod fishery. 35,000 jobs were lost in Newfoundland alone in the 1990s. In Africa and Asia, fish scarcity spurred women traders to barter sex just for access to purchase fish, contributing to the spread of HIV. Meanwhile, large seafood companies are enslaving fishermen on Pacific tuna vessels and enslaving workers in Thailand shrimp processing plants. And overfishing by Asian nations caused some Somali fishers to turn to piracy since they could no longer make a living fishing which in turn makes it dangerous for the remaining fishermen to go out and fish. But there is progress and cause for hope. More and more countries are creating marine reserves. However, only 1% of the ocean is fully protected from fishing, while scientists recommend at least 30%. Good fisheries management in the US has resulted in some fish populations rebounding. Enforcement is improving thanks to international treaties and satellite technology. The second major threat, pollution. Who suffers because of ocean pollution? Sewage outflows are often located near poor communities, in my experience, and rarely in front of luxury hotels. Ocean currents move, move filth without regard for who created the problem. Endless waves of plastic, trash arrive on beaches far from the source of that pollution, burdening communities with cleanup. Local economies are devastated by the effects of oil spills, and the toxins that accumulate in seafood affect human health. But again, there is progress. Infrastructure has improved in many places around the world, with secondary wastewater treatment becoming more common. In New York City, my hometown, water quality in the harbor and rivers is better now than any time in the last 100 years. In Tampa Bay, Florida, seagrass meadows had almost vanished due to toxic pollution um, and have now been restored. Third, coastal development. Who suffers from unsustainable coastal development? Coastal development often entails privatization, which benefits corporations, but curtails the ways communities are able to continue to access the ocean as an economic and cultural resource and there are deadly repercussions of destroying coastal ecosystems for development. In Southeast Asia, extensive swaths of coastal mangroves have been bulldozed in favor of shrimp aquaculture ponds. Then, in the 2004 tsunami, the locations without mangroves were the most severely impacted because residents were left without natural protection from the deadly waves. Yet there is some progress here too. Habitat restoration can be highly effective from oyster reefs to seagrass to mangroves, local initiatives all over the world are slowly but surely replanting. 
a project spanning India, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, and Thailand, has worked with community groups to restore 150,000 square meters of mangroves across six kilometers of coastline. Oyster restoration efforts are also gaining steam. The good news for the ocean, and in turn for us, is that these, these three threats have clear solutions that can be implemented locally without necessarily requiring arduous federal policymaking or international cooperation. However, regardless of how well we address overfishing, pollution, and coastal development, there is still the specter of climate change. Who suffers from the impacts of climate change? Lost with coral reefs will be food and income for around 500 million people. Sea level rise will force mass exodus from the Marshall Islands, the Maldives, Kiribati, and other low-lying countries, creating many millions of climate refugees. Bangladesh produces only 0.3% of global carbon emissions, yet 160 million residents are expected to lose their homes to flooding. Entire communities in coastal Louisiana and Staten Island, New York, have already had to relocate. Likely next, native Alaskan villages, Miami, the Carolinas, including Princeville, the first town chartered by African Americans. There is progress on this front too, though far, far from enough. The Paris Climate Agreement was a major milestone for international policy, the C40 Cities Initiative, helping cities innovate to reduce carbon emissions and become more resilient to climate impacts. Renewable energy is supplying an increasing share of our power at an increasingly competitive price. Coastal ecosystems have an incredibly powerful natural capacity for sequestering carbon, far more per square kilometer than terrestrial forests. And the emerging blue carbon movement has uh, thus prioritized coastal restoration and protection. Yet consider this, what becomes of the fishers when the fish simply leave, moving towards the poles in search of cooler water? And who will pay the, to relocate the hundreds of millions who will be inundated by sea level rise? What of the communities devotedly protecting their local coral reefs only to see them decimated by warming and acidification? Ocean conservation, you see, is about people, and more specifically, it's about marginalized people, the communities of color and poor and working class communities whose well-being and livelihood are the most deeply affected. Either they are excluded from accessing ocean resources or are relegated to the most denuded and polluted places. And although they bear the greatest brunt of the impacts, they've often had the least hand in causing it. The examples I've listed of progress we've made to date is obviously not nearly enough, and further, uh, has not been grounded in equity. Inland, it's certainly no coincidence where garbage dumps, power plants, pipelines, and super fun sites are located. Poor communities and communities of color endure disproportionate exposure to toxic air, land, and water. New Orleans, Flint, Standing Rock, and countless places between exemplify the need to prevent such communities from bearing the brunt of environmental devastation. Hence, in the last few decades, as the environmental movement arose, right alongside it arose the environmental justice movement. According to the US Environmental Protection Agency, and I rechecked the website this morning, this is still in fact up there, <laughs> Environmental justice will exist when, quote, everyone enjoys the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. The need for environmental justice clearly extends to the coastline and into the sea. Ocean conservation is a social justice issue. Overfishing, pollution, coastal development, and climate change tend to impact marginalized communities first and worst, but no one is immune. Solutions exist, but we need a robust intersectional coalition to implement them. It's going to be hard and complicated, and the stakes are high. The following 10 principles and approaches can serve as an initial guide for addressing ocean conservation as the social justice issue that it is. One. Diversify environmental leadership. Only 12% of environmental NGO staff 
and 4.6% of board members are people of color. As Whitney Tome of Green 2.0 puts it, if we are not including the people most directly impacted by environmental inequity, then the best interests of their communities will not be represented. Two, diversify the scientific research community. Who does the research determines what research gets done and what communities benefit from the results of that research. The fact that I grew up in Brooklyn with a Jamaican architect father and a white English teacher mother singing jazz and going to fancy schools has certainly informed my work with Caribbean communities on sustainable ocean use. Speaking of communities, three, consult communities. <laughs> Listen to the people on the front lines. Fishers, divers, boat captains, tour guides, naturalists uh, have not only seen ocean health deteriorate, but often, in my experience interviewing hundreds of these local experts across the Caribbean, they also have keen insights on how to turn things around. Listen to community leaders, especially the elders. Four, restructure institutions. We need to bring more people into the policymaking process for crafting and implementing policies, and we likely need to change some laws to do that to ensure our system works for all, and not just the privileged and wealthy. Five, apply systems thinking. Fishers I interviewed in Curacao were quick to point out that fishing restrictions alone would not make for sustainability. And of course they were right. While it is politically much easier to regulate poor fishing communities than to regulate the wealthy uh, tourism and oil industries, that is ineffective scapegoating. Solutions must reflect the interconnectedness of threats to ocean health. Six, acknowledge intersectionality. The North Atlantic Marine Association puts it this way, who fishes matters. Sustainable ocean use is a complex social issue. Race, class, gender, all play a role in who has access to and who benefits from ocean conservation. It's all intertwined. So partnerships with groups that focus on civil rights, education, health, and nutrition are not tangential, but core. Seven, conduct interdisciplinary research. Given the social complexities around conservation, we need interdisciplinary research, ecology, sociology, economics, on the distribution of costs and benefits of ocean degradation across communities and across economic sectors. Such research should be built around collaboration and transparency among local scientists, communities, and stakeholders. Nine, sorry, eight, I can't count. <laughs> Remedy past wrongs. When coastal development or pollution ruins nursery habitats and fishing collapses, and communities ache, no matter how closely fishers follow the regulations. It's time to consider how, for example, the tourism sector, worth 30 billion a year on coral reefs alone, could compensate the artisanal fishing sector for such losses. Nine, Revitalize the blue economy. When we think about supporting the shift to green jobs, we should also think about blue jobs too. Local fishermen bring great value to their economies and food systems. And as I just mentioned, coastal tourism is a many billion dollar industry. The Harbor School, public high school in New York City, prepares students for maritime trades, but jobs in this sector are sparse. We need to invest in revitalizing our ports and working waterfronts and empowering and employing the people who live nearby. 10, finally. Some traditions do not scale. Communities will also have to change some of their cultural practices. When ecosystems were healthy, catching entire schools of fish was fine for subsistence on islands with a few thousand people. Throwing trash into the sea was fine when that trash was banana leaves. But with the human population over seven and a half billion and most trash now made of plastic, things have to change. We need to develop new habits and norms. Tackling these challenges justly will require changing human behavior, shifting incentives, and becoming inclusive, working at all levels from the micro-local to the global and building political will. Another future is possible, and we can see it emerging. When Cabo Pulmo, a coastal village in Mexico, was feeling the impacts of overfishing. The community got together and created a marine reserve, closing part of their waters to fishing. That reserve, well supported and enforced by the community, allowed fish populations to rebound, increasing 463% over the following decade. 
When a huge development of resorts and condos was proposed threatening that reserve, the community built an even broader coalition and successfully fought that development. The town is now thriving with an economy based on small scale ecotourism. In Barbuda, the Waite Institute's Blue Halo Initiative, which I formerly led, developed comprehensive and science-based fishing and ocean zoning regulations based on over a year of community consultations. Over many iterations, stakeholders found a balance between preserving traditions, allowing for development, and ensuring long-term sustainability. I hope to see their fish populations and economy follow in Cabo Pulmo's footsteps. But both these places relied on local expert knowledge, of ecosystems, built consensus around a bold alternative vision for the future, and created a clear path to get there. Nonetheless, the specters of climate change and future unsustainable development still loom large. People often discuss ocean health as all or nothing, as a dead ocean or a healthy one, but there is a whole spectrum in between from zero to 100. We need to be honest with ourselves. That 100 is out of our reach now, but wherever we land, at 20 or 80 is within our control. And so many lives, livelihoods, and cultures hang in that balance. You'll notice that the examples I've given throughout are all local, cities, islands, communities, getting together and charting a new path. We cannot afford to wait for governments and international bodies to take the initiative. Most simply will not, unless the citizens demand it. I'm heartened by how readily citizens are standing up to demand equality and justice these days. The wave of collect collective action we are now seeing, from the Women's March to the March for Science, are cause for hope. It's time to build a social justice movement for and within ocean conservation. Here's to ocean justice. Thank you. Thank you.